Hello, I'm Simon Wallace, a PhD student at Osgood Hall Law School and an immigration refugee lawyer. Before I returned to my graduate studies, I was a full-time immigration detention lawyer based in the Immigration Holding Center here in Toronto. This video has been prepared for a workshop on fact-finding in immigration detention reviews, the larger purpose of which is to bring together people working on evidence law with people working on administrative law and seeing what it is they have to say to each other. We're using immigration detention law as a case study uh, to see what these uh, respective scholars can, can, can learn from each other. Canadian immigration detention law is a complex and changing field. To determine whether a person can be detained or whether they must be released, adjudicators interpret statutory law, regulatory law, the common law, the constitution, international human rights instruments, the evidence of the state, the evidence of the detainee, and their own, their own tribunal's guidelines. The objectives of this presentation is to provide a high level overview of immigration detention law in Canada to basically get us all on the same page. I've got three specific areas I wanna cover. Who can be arrested and det detained using immigration law? What's the adjudicative process? How are these cases decided? And how is evidence admitted and considered in the detention review context? First, who can be arrested pursuant to immigration law? The courts tell us that there is a high level uh, macro reason that uh, immigration detention law exists is to enable the machinery of immigration control or to enable the, the machinery of deportation. The purpose of, uh, of administrative detention, of immigration detention law, is to make immigration law and immigration law enforcement work. Sometimes the state says it needs to seize control of a person's body so that it can make sure that some other related immigration purpose uh, can, be, can be achieved uh, or enabled. So from this uh, high level principled understanding, we can draw a, a few basic conclusions. Immigration detention law is only going to be something that's ever experienced by non-citizens. It would not make sense and it would be unlawful to detain a citizen uh, using immigration law because they'll never be deported and they'll never be subject to any kind of immigration control purpose. It would also be inappropriate to detain a non-citizen for some purpose and ancillary or unrelated to immigration control. For example, if the state wanted to punish someone for some sort of misconduct, they are not entitled to use immigration detention law to achieve that penal purpose. The only legitimate purposes for which immigration detention law can be used are immigration control purposes. Those purposes are enumerated in, in statutory law by the Immigration Refugee Protection Act. And that act fundamentally outlines four different bases upon which uh, someone can be detained, four different purposes that the, the state can cite to justify the detention and deprivation of someone's liberty. The first is flight risk. Uh, a person, the state may uh, allege that a person is unlikely to uh, attend at the airport for their own deportation or unlikely to attend a deportation hearing or some other immigration control hearing. To ensure their presence for deportation, to ensure their presence at a hearing, the state can arrest and detain someone so they're available for that, uh, that immigration control purpose. Two, one of the purposes of, uh, of immigration law, one of the, the stated purposes, is to protect the Canadian public from uh, dangerous people. Uh, the, uh, the, the statute uh, explains that if someone is a, a danger to the public, they can be detained, they can be denied access to Canadian territory while their immigration process is resolved if they pose a danger to the Canadian public or or, or the or Canadian society. A third reason would be to allow the state to investigate someone's identity. Sometimes the state will encounter a non-citizen or a person and they're not sure who they are. Is this person someone who has been deported in the past, who is uh, unwelcome, who is inadmissible in Canada for some other reason? And the state is conducting their own investigation to figure out who that person is. They can be detained 
while that uh, investigation proceeds. Finally, there will be some people that the, the government thinks are unwelcome because of uh, some misconduct on their part, their involvement perhaps in, in terrorism or war criminality or organized crime. And if the state says they need some time uh, to investigate uh, those investigations, uh, those allegations, and uh, wants to, to hold that person while that, uh, that investigation is ongoing, they may in some circumstances uh, be allowed to detain the person. So these are the four overarching purposes, the, the grounds that uh, can substantiate an immigration, the, the immigration detention of a non-citizen in Canada. Of course, just because a ground is made out does not mean that the person will necessarily or should be detained. It is now the law, it has not always been the law, but it is now the law in Canada that every immigration detention must be proportionate to its purpose. It would be, uh, the, the Canadian courts say, inappropriate and unlawful to detain someone if the, uh, that the detention, the experience of the detention was entirely disproportionate, out of whack, with the immigration control objective uh, that the, the state was trying to, that is trying, the state is trying to achieve. So there's some factors that uh, the regulations that the courts instruct adjudicators to consider. The reason for detention. If someone is being detained because they may be ordered, deported at some future date, years down the road, the state may have an interest in. Uh, ensuring their uh, availability and attendance at removal, but that uh, the, the, the case law tells us is not as strong a risk, uh, strong an interest in detention when the person is a, a danger. So immediately we have this uh, sense that some detentions are more serious than others. The seriousness of the detention then gets balanced against other factors. If how long has the detention been? It's one thing to detain someone for two days. It's another thing to detain them for two years. How long will it go on for? It's one thing to detain someone if the detention will end tomorrow because it, a flight is scheduled the next day. It's another thing if everyone knows it's going to take years and years and years until the immigration control objective is proceeded, is achieved. Delay, if the reason that the detention carries on uh, is because one party is not doing its job, uh, that would uh, be something for an adjudicator to consider or the interests of a child. Perhaps most importantly, though, is the existence of an alternative to detention. Fundamental justice in Canada, the courts explain, uh, would not allow for someone to be uh, detained, kept in custody, when there is some other way of meeting an immigration control objective within the community someone's willing to supervise a person and ensure that they attend a, a deportation hearing, there's no need for that person to be uh, it, it kept in jail. This isn't a closed list. Uh, the courts uh, direct adjudicators to turn their mind to any relevant consideration that bears on the detention to ensure that in all cases, all the time, only the, the only people being detained are being detained in, in proportionate circumstances. Adjudication. Every single detention case must be reviewed by an independent adjudicator in Canada. Once someone is arrested, similar to the criminal bail context, they must be brought uh, immediately before a independent adjudicator. In the immigration context, this adjudicator is called a member, a member of the immigration division, which is a, a, a subsection of the immigration refugee board. The reasons for every detention must be reviewed 48 hours or as soon thereafter as is practical after an arrest. If detention is ordered at that first hearing, the reasons must be reviewed again at, seven, at the seven day mark. If detention is ordered, it must be reviewed every 30 days thereafter. The point, the point is to ensure that some independent official is monitoring, paying attention to detention making sure that it's not disproportionate, making sure that the case is moving forward and making sure that there's a change in circumstances. Uh, for example, say partway through a case, uh, someone wins their refugee claim and they're not gonna be deported or a state says that they uh, won't issue a travel document. There's someone monitoring, uh, monitoring for a change of circumstances and can order a person's release um, 
uh, if and when it becomes necessary. These cases are, are quick. They're usually decided the same day, uh, knowing that there will be another review uh, shortly, relatively shortly thereafter. In terms of burdens, the state bears the evidentiary burden, uh, the, justificatory, uh, the, the justificatory burden in every single detention case. They must prove on a balance of probabilities that a, uh, a ground of detention is made out, that there is a legitimate purpose for the detention, that the detention is proportionate and that it is necessary. Now, I say that they must prove everything on a balance of probabilities, but when we look at the differing legal questions, we can sense, uh, begin to understand how in the day-to-day -day adjudicative context, this question of uh, burdens is somewhat difficult to pin down, a, a little imprecise. So if a person can be detained as a danger to the public, well, what does it mean to be a danger? Does it mean that there's a 50% plus one chance that they're likely to hurt someone if released, or is it something well below that, that threshold? It's, it's a little un, un, unclear. Or another example, if someone's being detained uh, uh, for, to allow for an identity investigation, the law says they can be detained so long as the government is taking reasonable steps to move the investigation forward. Well, what are those reasonable steps? How are they assessed? We can begin to see that even if the, the burden rests with the, the government, the particular nature of the legal question is going to to bear on the, the, the nature of that burden, the nature of the evidence led, and, and how that evidence is assessed. Uh, the state has a right to, to lead evidence to make their case, but the detainee has important rights too. As in the criminal context, detainees enjoy a right to silence in the immigration detention, uh, uh, the immigration detention context. They can sit back and just as would be the case in a, a criminal case, Hold the state to its proof. Say, if you want to detain me, if you say I'm a flight risk, if you say that I'm a danger to the public, prove it. And if you can't prove it, I have to be released. They have a right to receive in advance all relevant information in the government's possession, a right to disclosure, a right to know everything, inculpatory or, uh, or exculpatory, that may help their case or hurt their case in the, in the state's possession. They can challenge the state's case. They can examine the state's witnesses. They can insist upon cross-examining uh, uh, investigators uh, who, who have uh, uh, presented evidence to the tribunal. Detainees can be represented. They can make legal arguments. Uh, and they can lead their own relevant evidence, maybe to discredit the government's case, or maybe to show that there's a viable alternative to the detention, that there's a bonds person, that there's somewhere they can live, that there's someone who will supervise them. Uh, the tribunal, uh, and this is much of what we'll be talking about, is not bound by any legal or technical rule of evidence. And statute explains that it can receive and base a decision on any evidence that it considers credible and trustworthy in the circumstance. One long-term criticism of the immigration detention uh, adjudicative project is that uh, this uh, this direction is a relaxation of evidentiary standards that by uh, eschewing the, the by, by not being required to follow the specific rules that we find in evidence law, anything can go. Uh, and sometimes this we sort of see this uh, this criticism materialize when double, triple, quadruple hearsay is admitted and someone says that there's a problem with that evidence or, uh, there are, or character evidence is led, or newspaper articles are led to substantiate an allegation and no one who actually saw something is, um, uh, is called to, to testify. There is though an, another view, I've, I've exerted part of the, the chairperson's guideline, the, the, the chairperson's direction to all the members of the immigration uh, division. You know, the members should play an active role in ensuring that they have a sufficient evidentiary record upon which to base their decision. We can see that this other tendency pull, uh, pulling in the opposite direction, that even if the legal and technical rules don't apply, there is this larger obligation uh, upon adjudicators to make sure that no case proceeds without good, uh, solid, and, and fair and robust evidence. So let me summarize. 
The point of this presentation was to, uh, to, to indicate, to go over what immigration detention law is in Canada. The point of immigration detention law is to ensure that immigration enforcement can work, that there are those, when, that when there are those times where the, the state needs, says it needs to deprive a person of their liberty uh, in order to ensure that an immigration control uh, and can be achieved, that the, the state is enabled to do that. That power is not unlimited. It is subject to proportionality. Uh, it, the, the case is subject to ongoing review. Uh, at those reviews, both parties can uh, challenge evidence, lead evidence, and there is this question, uh, and this is the, the question which we'll be discussing at the workshop, about how to ensure that the, the evidence that's led at those hearings is sound, robust, and solid, even if the legal and technical rules of evidence law don't apply. So the question I, I suggest that uh, we can have in our minds is how, in spite of this, can, in spite of this uh, direction, is it that uh, immigration detention law can learn, still learn from evidence law, and then vice versa? What can evidence law uh, learn from this adjudicative context where every single day important decisions about people's liberty are being decided? I look forward to seeing everyone at the workshop and, and thank you very much.